some of these sources do call this book the book of counting. So to call it numbers is not a mistake. But generally in Hebrew it's called the Midbar and into the wilderness. We're in chapter 11. And uh, last week we ended by talking about this these uh, in verse 16 here with the 70 elders and uh, the problem that God's commandment to Moses gathered to me 70 men the problem that poses for any kind of uh, okay. uh, can, yeah, we're can you hear me your volume up a little bit oh I can I can plug in a mic I can plug in a microphone well you're fine it's just our uh our connection to the TV because we get you on the big screen also. Oh, all right. Testing, testing. <laughs> You're a big boy. Testing. I might be able to turn my volume up here too. I don't know. Check one, two, la 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 la. Input volume, input volume. I can boost that a little bit. Oh yeah, that made a difference. That should be better. That's I'm not awesome. clip. I'm not clipping or anything. I'm a, it shouldn't be any distortion, is there? No. No. All right. Well, hopefully that helps. <laughs> yeah. Volume. Is it uh, audible? Yeah, keep talking. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. So, we're, we're still trying to hook up in a separate, second thing here, but we can't find it on the. Um, I, it's not all right. So, well, we're just in the review uh, stage anyway, so. So uh, last week we talked about this commandment to gather seventy people. And there's a problem that uh, no, but no, but nobody was able to pick up on. We had to be told by Ramban, actually by the Talmud, what the problem was, which is that you have 12 tribes, and each tribe is going to want the same number of people on the Sanhedrin. Each tribe is going to want equal representation on, uh, on this high court. So 70 is not divisible by 12. You would need 72. 72 is, uh, would give you six people from each tribe. But with 70, you could get six people from 10 of the tribes, and uh, the other two would just get five. Can you hear, is it good? Can you hear me? Can you turn your volume up a little bit more, Stephen? Let me see. No, that's the wrong preferences. I mean, I. it's just a, a tiny fraction. Let me, let, let me go ahead and plug in. I have a microphone right here. I just we need, I'll just need to go grab uh, the uh, preamp. Okay. That should help.
chest one too. Let me see. Um, okay, yeah. Um, All right. Um, I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's louder. I can get closer to it though, so it should be louder. Yeah, when you're close. Yeah. All right. Got my headphones fixed. Can you hear? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. All right. So this should be better theoretically. Uh, oh, it's. I'm getting. I'm getting some distortion. It's telling me that I'm getting distortion. A little but it's not bad. Well, I should be able to fix it. Test, 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 test. Oh man, where is that? <laughs> I got the gain turned. Wait, where is that? Test, test, one, two. Test, one, two. That's clear. That's clear, yeah? Yes. Oh, good. All right. So we'll stick with this for now, unless there's still a problem. That's, that's a lot better. It's good. Okay. So um, you got to pick 70 people. You have to make it divisible by 12, or you, or you have to short two of the tribes, one, one person on the Sanhedrin. So um, this, uh, the, tra the Talmud Tractate Sanhedrin clarifies that what Moses did was he um, drew lots. He had, he had 72 uh, uh, straws or whatever, you know, and 70 were long straws and two were short straws. And he was going to randomly pick out of 72 people which 70 would go to uh, be, on, be in this group. And Eldad and Maydad volunteered to um, stay home because they consider themselves not worthy of the honor. And this is why they actually got to prophesy despite not having gone with Moses on this little adventure. And uh, some opinions say that they actually were able to prophesy in their own right. And it was not just some like leftover spirit from Moses that they got, that they got their own uh, prophetic spirit from God and not just to honor them because of their uh, display of humility. But then, but now we're at Ramad's going to go. Um, so, so with that, we skipped ahead a little bit to talk about that because it, it's uh, relevant to this number 70. And um, it's something that Ramad expects us to know when he gets to that part. But now Ram's, Ramad's going to go into more detail about the significance of this number 70. So um, he says, our sages of blessed memory have mentioned that there are 70 nations in the world with 70 languages. This is, probably shouldn't take that literally because there's more than that, but maybe in the history, some historical period, that would be, tr would be true. I don't know. The number changes probably, but the, uh, the rabbis may group some together as one people or one language that we wouldn't. He's about in verse 26. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, Numbers 11, actually, I mean, Numbers 11, 16, 70, 70 elders. Oh, yeah. Right. So each one of these nations has a constellation in the heavens and a heavenly minister above. Right. So there's, this is mirrored in the heavens. There's 70 angels. Like the idea that is stated in Daniel and the minister of the Persian kingdom um, writes in the minister of Greece in Daniel chapter 10, where he gets visited by an angel that tells him about these other angels or these other heavenly beings. Ramban also mentions Isaiah 24, 21, which says Hashem will deal with the hosts of heaven in heaven and with the kings of the earth on the earth. So there's, again, this mirror you know, there's Egypt and there's the Pharaoh, but there's also this angel in heaven that represents Egypt. Ramban continues, the sages said further that the 70 bulls offered on the holiday of Sukkot, which you have to go add them up to find that out, but the 70 bulls offered on the holiday of Sukkot allude to the 70 nations. 
And then in uh, Perque de Rebeliezer, which is a fun read, um, when God goes down to confuse the language of the people building the Tower of Babel, he, he says, you know, he says, let's go confuse their language. But in the Torah, it doesn't say who he's talking to. Perque de Rebeliezer says he's talking to those 70 angels, the 70 angels that represent the 70 nations. There's another 70 that Ramban mentions, which is the number of people who went down to Egypt, the number of uh, Abraham's descendants, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then he had his 12 kids, and then they had some wives and some kids, and the whole number of everybody who went to Egypt after the incident with Joseph was 70. Ramban says, this number contains within it all possible viewpoints by virtue of its including all human powers, right? So this, this, the other 70 that we're missing here is, is actually in the Zohar, which is that the, the human person has 70 faculties or 70 powers. I don't know what those are. There's, I've never found a list of them, but the number may be more important than the details here. Similarly, at the giving of the Torah, 70 elders of Israel in Exodus 24 go up to Sinai. They don't go all the way up, but they go part way up. For it is fitting, Ramban says, that by this complete number, the glory of the divine presence should rest upon them as it rests in the celestial camp among 70 angels. So again, it's a mirror. There's 70 angels in God's celestial camps, maybe surrounding his throne or surrounding his chariot. And similarly, to mirror that, God asked Moses to bring up 70 elders so that on earth it would be as it is in heaven. 70 people surrounding the camp or surrounding the place where God was meeting with Moses. And Ramban derives from this that the people of Israel comprise God's legions on earth. The, the 70 elders are representative, right? So... The legions in heaven are all these angels, and the 70 around God's throne are the chief angels. But on earth, who's, what, who's the representatives? Well, it's the uh, people of Israel. And so these 70 elders mirror those 70 angels. Ramban continues, The ark, just like the ark, and the cover, and the tabernacle, were made in the semblance of the celestial ministers of God. He doesn't go into detail on this too much, but Bachia does, uh, Rabbeinu Bachia, who wrote a couple generations after Ramban and explains some Ramban. Um, the uh, tabernacle was divided, you can divide it into three sections. The inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, is like God himself. And then the, um, the room outside of that with the candelabra, right? The menorah and the showbread and the incense altar. These are representative of the heavens, like uh, the planets and so forth. And then the, the zone where we live, where we are born and live and die, is uh, analogous to the courtyard, where all the animals are brought in and sacrificed, where the animals die. And Ramban uh, finishes the, his comparisons with the, um, the fact that the 12 tribes in their encampment were divided in order to um, resemble the chariot that Ezekiel saw in his vision. Sorry. Sorry, Jacob, but that's where you started at. Whoa. <laughs> Your dad just hooked uh, up an external speaker here that even boosts you more on this end. So. All right. Okay, so did so you miss something? No, that's good. Oh, okay. Uh, Ramban continues, Now Moses was presiding over the 70 elders, and this is an allusion to Israel, which is a unique nation on earth, over the other nations. So in this whole system, the 70 elders represents all the nations except for Israel, and Moses represents Israel, so there's 71. And similarly, uh, similarly, our sages received by tradition that every great Sanhedrin, which sits in the temple of God, which a lot of people don't know, the Sanhedrin actually met in the temple in the room of hewn stone. Um, 
which sits in the temple of God in the place that he will choose for his presence, should similarly be 70 in number with the president over them. The word in Hebrew there is Nasi. So you'll see references to that, the Nasi of the Sanhedrin. The uh, chief of the Sanhedrin is an important position for the nation of Israel. Just as Moses, our teacher, was over the 70 elders, and thus they are 71 altogether. Now we're almost to 72, so it turns out 72 is an important number. And the reason they can only have 70 people was because they needed room for Moses to be number 71, and then the 72nd, someone else. Ramban says, similarly, similarly, the great letters or the letters of the great and explicit name of God are 72 in number. Right? So this is a name, this is like a Kabbalistic idea that God has lots of names. And the one that we find as his proper name in the Torah is um, this is the four letter tetragrammaton, but he also has a 72 letter name. And Ramban says that the letters in that name correspond to the, sevenly, uh, the seven heavenly ministers, or 70 heavenly ministers, and then, and then Michael to make 71. And the 72nd is God himself, who is master over them all. It is to this idea, Ramban says, that scripture alludes when it says God stands in the divine assembly. In the midst of judges, he judges. Right, so you have the seventy members of the Sanhedrin, and then you have the 71st person, who's the Nasi, and then you have God. God is there, and the, so that did, it actually does end up making 72. Now Ramban goes, uh, he continues on to comment on that psalm, which starts, God stands in the divine assembly in the midst of judges he judges, which is Psalm 82. He says in uh, verse 2 of Psalm 82, it says, Until when will you judge lawlessly? Meaning that God wants judges to judge fairly. Because God is with them, concurring with their judgment, they must, they, they, they need to have a fear of God so as not to judge incorrectly. Because they don't, if they judge incorrectly, it reflects badly on God, because God is there with them. Ramban invokes Isaiah 65, 3, which says the people who anger me in my very presence, a judge who judges wrongfully, who oppresses people instead of judging righteously, it angers God. It doesn't just like anger God, though. I mean, we all do things all the time that God is not happy with, but God is uniquely present in a, in a courtroom of the people of Israel, in a Beit Din or in a Sanhedrin. So to, to make a mistake there is to make a mistake you know, while you're under the microscope, in a sense. The psalmist goes on in the same psalm, in verse 6, he says, You are like the Elohim, sons of the Most High are you all. And in this, um, Ramban interprets Elohim, which can be a name for God. He interprets Elohim as judges. So... He's saying, you, you Sanhedrin, you who, who are judging the nation of Israel in this capacity are, you know, like Elohim. You're, you're like supernal angels. You're, you've got an important job. And Ramban here is using this comparison again to, to drive home the fact that the 70 judges, the 70 elders on the Sanhedrin mirror the 70 celestial ministers which represent the nations before God's throne. All right. So let's, uh, we'll start reading now in verse 16 and we'll keep going until we get some more commentary. Hashem said to Moshe, gather to me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and its officers. Take them to the tent of meeting and have them stand there with you. I will descend and speak with you there, and I will withhold some of the spirit that is upon you and place it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, and you shall not bear alone. So this, this word withholding and God speaking to Moses, there's a few issues here that Ramban finds. The first is that almost all the time when God speaks to Moses, it tells us later on what he said. Ramban said that um, scripture does not elaborate on this speech of God to Moses. 
to tell us what it was, like it does everywhere else in the Torah, because the idea here is only to state that the elders about whom Scripture says that they prophesied did not hear any speech from the mouth of God, and he did not reveal himself to them in a vision or in a dream. Right? So God is saying, I will descend, in verse 17, I will descend and speak with you. With you. Imcha. Right? Not imchem, not a plural, but a singular you. He's only talking to Moses. <clears throat> now the other set, the 70 elders are going to understand and know what's happening, but they're not actually going to hear God's voice. They're just getting a little bit of Moses' spirit. And that's how they're going to know what the content of the prophecy is. And the word that it uses here in the Torah to describe is, well, it's conjugated from this, but the uh, root is atzilut, withholding, which is an interesting word Kabbalistically. If you know any Kabbalah, if you know any Kabbalah there's lots of, uh, you know, atzilut is a whole realm of reality, but it, Rama doesn't go into that here. Um, he just goes into some grammatical uh, stuff on what it means. And his um, conclusion seems to be that, um, well, he, he, he invokes a, a midrash, actually, but Midbar uh, Sinai Rabbah. What's happening here? Well, it can be compared to a king who entrusted his orchard to a guard and paid him in advance the full wages for guarding it. After some time, the guard said to him, I'm not able to guard all of it by myself. Bring some others that they should guard with me. Like, right? This is just like Moses asking for help to lead the people. The king said to him, I gave you my orchard to guard it, and I have already given you the full wages for guarding it. And now you say, bring me some others that they should guard with me. I shall indeed bring some others to guard with you, but you should know that I'm not going to pay them their wages from my own money, rather out of the wages that I paid you. From there, they will receive their wages. So to the Holy One, blessed is he, said to Moses, I gave you the spirit and knowledge needed to sustain my children by yourself. And I did not seek another person to assist you so that you should be unique in thy greatness. And now you seek another to assist you. Know that those others will not take anything from what is mine. Rather, I will withhold some of the spirit that is upon you and place it upon them. And now the most amazing sentence in this is this following sentence in the Midrash, which says, nevertheless, Moses did not lack anything. Moses did not lack anything. So even though the plain meaning of the Torah and, this, and the Midrash all interpret this to mean that some of the spirit will be withheld from Moses and given to these other guys, and even the analogy is that this guard is going to have to pay the other guards from his own wages. The Midrash concludes by saying Moses didn't end up having less of that spirit. So that's, that must be a uh, miracle. <clears throat> so Did these elders continue in this capacity to prophesy, or did they? Or was it a one-time deal? Ramban said they continued to uh, under. They continued to uh, have the spirit from Moses, and they continued to help him. And they would prophesy to the people, and Moses wouldn't have to bear everything by himself. All right, verse eighteen. To the people, you shall say, right? Because the original problem that caused Moses to complain was that. Uh, the people wanted meat, and he was kind of tired of it, and he didn't know what he was supposed to do for them, and and uh, he was overwhelmed. So now God is going to tell him how to deal with the people's uh, complaint that they didn't have enough meat. To the people you shall say, prepare yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of Hashem, saying, who will feed us meat? For it was better for us in Egypt. So Hashem will give you meat, and you will eat. Not for one day shall you eat, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days until an entire month of days, until it comes out of your nose and becomes repulsive to you, because you have rejected Hashem who is in your midst, and you have wept before him, saying, why did we leave Egypt? Rambam points out the obvious, which is that, you know, technically, if you're going for an entire month of days, you can't say not for one day, because there's one day in there. There's two days in there, there's five days and 10 days and 20 days. All those numbers are in there. Ramban says it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's not 
uh, it's not a hundred percent woodenly literal here. It's a figure of speech, not only for one day, right? The word's not there in Hebrew, but we definitely need to understand it as as meaning that not for only one day shall you eat, but until an, an entire month. <clears throat> Interestingly, they also complain about not having fish and onions and garlic and all of this. And God's not going to, um, God's not going to send any of that, just the meat, because that was the main complaint. Do they have water though? At this point, it looks like they do, but there will be times when they don't. How do they live? Or does he? Not give them water and they get I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely times during their uh, journeys where they are without water. This, this just doesn't happen to be one of them. Um, you know, they're going through, they're going through the midbar, right? It's the wilderness. That doesn't mean it's like the Sahara. There's uh, wells and rivers and things here and there in this area. So only sometimes are they in an area with no water. All right. So Ramban points out a problem, which is that it says they're going to eat it for a month, but then it says that some of these people die right away. They die with the meat still in, their, in between their teeth. Um, so what, which is it? Did they eat it for a month and then get tired of it? Or did they die right away? Ramban says, well, there's two different groups of people. There's the rabble that was among them. And then there's the children of Israel. So this rabble, this mixed multitude, the ones that had the craving and the, and the complaint first for meat. And those people died. But the children of Israel who sort of complained afterward and not as loudly um, ate meat for a month and got tired of it. And discarded the piles they had left, Ramban says. Moses said, verse 21, 600,000 foot soldiers are the people in whose midst I am, yet you say, I shall give them meat and they shall eat for a month of days. Can sheep and cattle be slaughtered for them and suffice for them? Or if all the fish of the sea will be gathered for them, would it suffice for them? Now, this is an odd verse. Rambam points it out right away. That... Uh, why, why on earth is Moses asking this question? He has seen quite a bit by this point. He's seen all the plagues and, and the parting of the sea and all these miracles. How is it that Moses now is doubting whether God can put on a barbecue? You know. So Ramban, Ramban um, immediately discards a couple of ancient opinions. Um, and there's several. There's several mutually exclusive opinions that we find in the Midrash and the Talmud. Rabbi Shimon thinks that Moses' question really is, would it be proper for you to give them meat just to kill them right after? <coughs> Not really an expression that of a lack of faith, but... He doesn't understand why God's going to fulfill their desire at all. If you're going to kill him, just kill him. And Rabbi Shimon thought, well, God's response kind of means they need to know before they die that I can do whatever I want and I am able to provide this meat. Um, Yehuda Hanasi had a different explanation. Moses' real question, according to Yehuda Hanasi, was, well, will this meat actually satisfy them? They're just looking for they're just looking for a reason to complain. They're still going to complain after you give them the meat, and the answer basically is the same. Um, according to uh, Yehuda Hanasi, they need to know that I'm able to do this. Ramban rejects both of the both of these interpretations because that's not what the Torah says. They, they're reading a little bit too much into this. And it's not, it's not fitting well with the plain words of uh, Scripture. 
so there's a third ancient explanation, which is Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said the words are to be understood according to their apparent meaning. Can you get enough meat? God. <laughs> and this is how Uncle Ellis translates it too. Ramban says this is this is the correct. Uh, you know, Akiva has understood the packet by the passage correctly. Moses really is asking God if this if he's got enough meat. The and he's so most so Ram, um, Ramban says the 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 question becomes not how do we understand this, but but yeah, this is astonishing. I mean, this this the implications of this are why Rabbi Shimon and Yehuda Nasi came up with different explanations of what Moses was really asking because they couldn't believe that Moses, the trusted one in God's entire house, would imply that God is not able to to pull together some uh, meat. And every every single person in the in Israel had already seen some greater miracle than this. So even Ezra takes a different tactic. Even Ezra says, well, Moses here is thinking that God's not just going to randomly do a miracle. God says that they're going to eat meat. God didn't say he was going to miraculously supply the meat. And Moses is just not counting on there being a miracle. Moses thought, well, you know, Maybe God only does miracles in order to corroborate his prophets. That was Ibn Ezra's uh, rationale. Moses, didn't, Moses didn't, wasn't aware of any other kind of miracle or any other reason to do a miracle than except to corroborate the word of a prophet. Ramban says this is, not, this is also not correct because God has even done the quail thing before. Like... There's been all, a lots of lots of things that Israel has gotten because they needed it or because they complained that they didn't have it already. In Exodus, God was already doing this stuff. And this it was all miraculous. So we still don't have a good explanation. Ram, so Rambam presents his own explanation. He says, the most sound explanation is that when God performs signs and wonders for Israel, they are an expression of kindness from him and they are all for benefit. For Hashem is good to all, his mercies are on all his works. It's from the Psalms. Except when God's fury goes forth against those who transgress his will, at which times he acts toward them with anger and with the attribute of justice to their complete detriment. Thus, miracles are performed only for complete beneficence through the attribute of mercy or for retribution through the attribute of justice. Right? It's not a mixed bag. When God does a miracle, Ramban says, it's either 100% beneficial or it's 100% re retribution or punishment. It's never, well, they're going to get what they asked for, but it's going to be kind of sucky. And they're not going to like it. You know, it's not a miracle. <laughs> it's, God doesn't use his, his overt power of, of overriding natural law to do this kind of stuff, this kind of, oh, they'll get it, but they won't like it kind of a thing. It's either 100% good or 100% bad. This is kind of a Kabbalistic viewpoint, kind of. I mean, I don't know. This These attributes, you know, God is either operating through mercy or, or through justice. Ramban has talked about before that sometimes one is cloaked in the other and so forth. But apparently Ramban thinks when it comes to overt miracles, violations of natural law, they only come through one of these two channels. So Ramban says now, when he said to Moses that he would give them what they requested and they would eat meat, but it would be repulsive to them, Moses knew that there would not be a miracle from God to create meat for them, uh, anything like, like the manna, which is a miracle. This is like the idea from our sages of blessed memory, which say an impure thing would never fall from heaven, which is a really interesting um, idea. And it comes, it actually comes from the adjudication of a certain case. So there was a guy named Rabbi Shimon ben Halafta who was um, cornered by lions. And in order to save him from his predicament, God miraculously created two pieces of meat. Um, 
And so he fed the lions this meat, but they only ate one of the pieces. So he took the other piece of meat to the rabbis to say, well, you know, it, I, don't, I don't know what animal this came from. It was, you know, sort of pre, uh, pre-slaughtered. It's already, it was already ready, ready to eat. Uh, is it kosher? You know, since I, it didn't, I don't, I don't, how do I know if it's pork or what, what it is or if it was slaughtered correctly? And, the, you know, it might seem like a silly question, but if, uh, you know, you don't want to assume something, maybe the meat was only for lions. Lions don't have to keep kosher. They can eat whatever. So, but the rabbis replied that an unkosher thing would never fall from heaven. So when God creates something completely new through a miracle, then um, it's going to be 100% good. And you can definitely, if it's meat, you can eat it. It's not going to be unkosher. God's not going to create some tainted or unkosher product. Now, there's another reason Ramban suggests, and this one is even maybe a little more convincing, as to why Moses has not assumed there's going to be a miracle. Because when God does these miracles, he always tells Moses specifically in advance. Right? He, in Exodus 16, Behold, I shall rain down for you bread from heaven. Or in Exodus 17, Behold, I shall stand before you by the rock in Horeb, and the water will come forth from it. But here, it doesn't say God's going to do anything. It just says, Tell the people to prepare to eat some meat. He doesn't, he doesn't say, say to Moses, Behold, I will bring meat, or anything like that. So Moses understood that God was actually not going to do a miracle. And so now that's, this is why Moses is astonished. He's like, short of a miracle, how will this meat appear? There's too many people and it's not enough animals. Right, verse 23. Hashem said to Moshe, is the hand of Hashem limited? Now you will see whether my word will happen to you or not. Moses left and spoke the words of Hashem to the people, and he gathered 70 men from among the elders of the people and had them stand around the tent. Hashem descended in a cloud and spoke to him, and he withheld some of the spirit that was upon him and gave it to the 70 men, the elders. When the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but did no more. Ramban says this, this did no more doesn't mean that they didn't keep uh, playing this role of elders who had some of Moses' spirit. What it means is they didn't go further than that in their prophetic level. They never got to Moses' level where they heard directly, uh, directly from God. They only heard sort of through this Moses channel. Verse 26, two men remained behind in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the second was Medad. The spirit, uh, spirit rested upon them. They had been among the recorded ones, but they had not gone out to the tent and they prophesied in the camp. The youth ran and told Moshe and he said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of Moses since his youth, spoke up and said, My Lord Moses, incarcerate them. So why is Joshua upset that these guys are prophesying? Ramban says, well, you know, if someone's, these, these guys did not go to the tent, so we are not assuming that they're going to have received this gift of prophecy. Our first assumption might be that they have a false spirit or, the, or an evil spirit or that they've gone insane. <clears throat> but um, another explanation that is derived from the Gemara is uh, the real issue here is that you, these guys were prophesying uh, sort of out of turn. Joshua didn't doubt that they were legitimate prophets in this interpretation, but rather they should have just let Moses do his job, right? These, to, to, to prophesy while Moses is there is like the student, you know, stepping up to answer a question in the presence of his teacher, which is one of those things that the, in, in, in Jewish practice is frowned upon. It's forbidden unless the teacher lets it happen right the teacher can voluntarily give up his honor of uh, as being the only one who knows what's going on he can give that up voluntarily and let the student speak in his presence or render a legal decision in his presence 
And, and, and in fact, that is what the Gemara says Moses does here. Moses responds to Joshua, which is in verse 29, are you being zealous for my sake? Would that the entire people of Hashem would be prophets if Hashem would but place his spirit upon them. This is Moses relinquishing his, the, the respect due to him. Which, uh, which would be that if Moses is around, no one else should be talking about what God wants. And we defer to Moses, right? All right. Verse 30. Moses was brought into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. A wind went forth from Hashem and brought forth quail from the sea and spread them over the camp, a day's journey this way and a day's journey that way, all around the camp, in two cubits above the face of the earth. The people rose up all that day and all the night and all the next day and gathered up the quail, the one with the least gathered in ten piles, and they spread them all, all over the camp. The meat was still between, uh, between her teeth, not yet chewed, when the wrath of Hashem flared against the people, and Hashem struck a very mighty blow against the people. He named that place Kibrot Hatha'ava because there they buried the people who had been craving. From Kirot to Ava, the people journeyed to Hazarot, and they remain in Hazarot. So we see here that this is not an uh, this is not an overt miracle. This is a hidden miracle. Because wind is something that can happen any time. The quail were already there; they were just somewhere else. So this this is um, one of those miracles that you could explain completely through natural means. It's not like quail popped out of thin air. So Moses was correct. It wasn't going to be an overt miracle. God just brought the quail with some wind. All right. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses regarding the Cushite woman he had married, for he had married Cushite woman. They said, was it only to Moses that Hashem spoke? Did he not speak to us as well? And Hashem heard. Now the man Moses was exceedingly humble more than any person on the face of the earth. You keep in mind, Moses is right in this. It's kind of funny. <laughs> but um, he, but uh, he had to write this, right? Because it's the, it's the Holy Spirit. So the reason this here is here in the narrative is that this is explaining why God had to intervene and do something. Because Moses is so humble that he's not even like speaking up for himself in this situation. Um, he's not reacting to this personal attack, whether he knew about it or not. Even if he knew about it, he wouldn't um, respond to it because of his humility. So God had to intervene. Even Ezra says that this is explaining why it was a sin for Miriam and, Miriam and Aaron to speak against Moses, because they're sort of they're sort of implying that Moses is setting himself up above everybody is better than everybody, and the Torah has to tell us, well, it's in, in fact that was not the case. Um, so Miriam, Miriam and Aaron are saying things that are not true. That's part of their sin. Um, was Moses present? Or were they talking behind his back? Sifrei says that Moses was actually there. Moses, uh, Moses was right there uh, with them. And so this seems to accord with Ramban's first explanation. That Moses was just so humble he didn't even want to respond to this, but God decided that he was going to. That may be a good lesson. You know, vengeance is, is God's, right? Verse 4, Hashem said suddenly to Moses, to Aaron, and to Miriam, you three go out to the tent of meeting, and the three of them went out. This word suddenly, Ankylos translates as immediately. So as soon as they said this, God nips it right in the bud. What, is the, what does Moses' wife have to do with this idea of God speaking to Moses? It, doesn't, it, it says they complained about his wife. But then when they, what they actually said doesn't have anything to do with his wife. So um, what, the, what the sages have said is that what's going on here is Moses, if you remember, separated himself from his wife. 
Um, he didn't have intimate contact with her because he needed to be in a state where he could receive prophecy at any time. And you can't be ritually unclean and receive prophecy. And, um, you, you know, intimate relations make you ritually unclean until evening. It's not sinful. It's just, it puts you at a, a level at which you can't at any moment receive uh, prophecy from God. So Moses is, um, swore off that type of intimate contact with his wife. And Moses and, uh, or, and Aaron and Miriam thought, well, what's, you know, that poor, that poor lady. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe he just, <laughs> maybe he just doesn't find her attractive anymore. Maybe he's, uh, he, maybe he's not really doing this for the correct reason. All right. So God has, God is only going to talk to Aaron and Miriam. So verse five, Hashem descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance to the tent. Then he summoned Aaron and Miriam. The two of them went out. Why did he say you three in verse four? Why did he have Moses even show up if he's only going to talk to Aaron and Miriam? Well, the only way to be forgiven for Lashon Hara, for evil speech, is to be forgiven by the person you spoke against. So Moses has to be there so that they can beg him for forgiveness right away. He also wanted Moses to see that God was going to bat for him. So the two reasons why Moses is here. Verse 6, he said, Hear now my words. If your prophet shall be... Hashem, in a vision I make myself known to him, in a dream I speak with him. Not so is my servant Moses. In my entire house he is the trusted one. Mouth to mouth do I speak to him. Not mouth to ear? In a clear vision, not in riddles, at the image of Hashem does he gaze. Why did you not fear to speak against my servant Moses? So, um, again, we see here Moses is at a different level than the other prophets. Ramban calls this the vision of the back. Moses actually saw and heard God in some sense, not completely clearly, but much more clearly than any other prophet. All right. So there's a problem with that idea, which is that there's one verse that appears to equate Moses with another prophet and put them on the same level. It's Jeremiah 15, 1. Even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, I would have no desire for this people. So this, this verse makes Samuel and Moses equivalent. So does that mean that there's two prophets in Israel who are the best? Um, well, no. The reason that... Moses and Samuel are equated in Jeremiah 15 is because of the specific situation, which is that there's a drought and there's no one who can convince God to bring rain. Not even Moses, who multiple times stood in the breach and turned away God's wrath from the people of Israel in the wilderness, and not even Samuel, who had a probably lesser known, but demonstrated ability to pray for rain and have it come right away. Although it was for a different reason. It's in 1 Samuel 12, 17, God asks, or Samuel asks God for thunder and rain as a sign of God's anger. And his plea is granted instantly. So we have a couple of candidates here who you would want on your team if you've got a drought but God says, no, not even if you have those guys, either of those guys. <clears throat> All right. Verse 9, the wrath of Hashem flared up against them, and he left. The cloud had departed from atop the tent, and behold, Miriam was afflicted with tzara'as, leprosy, like snow. Aaron turned to Miriam, and behold, she was afflicted with tzara'as. Aaron said to Moses, I beg you, my Lord, do not cast a sin upon us, for we have been foolish and we have sinned. Let her not be like a corpse, like one who leaves his mother's womb with half his flesh having been consumed. Moses cried out to Hashem, saying, Please God, heal her now. 
Hashem said to Moses, were her father to spit in her face, would she not be humiliated for seven days? Let her be quarantined outside the camp for seven days, and then she may, she may be brought in. So Miriam was quarantined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not journey until Miriam was brought in. Then the people journeyed from Hazarot, and they encamped in the wilderness of Paran. This problem here, which you have to have a pretty good memory to realize, in uh, Numbers 10, right, two chapters ago, they were already encamped in the wilderness of Paran. Are they going back and forth? Or what? Ramban says, Hazarot is in the wilderness of Paran. So it's just saying that they went to another place in the wilderness of Paran. It doesn't say specifically where they went, which was Kadesh Barnea, because maybe it took a long time to get there. And there's maybe several journeys in between. Who knows? <coughs> All right. Next Torah portion, Parsha Shalach. Send. Shalach Lacha. Send forth for yourself spies. <coughs> Numbers 13. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, send forth for yourself men and let them investigate the land of Canaan that I gave to the children of Israel. So the first problem here that every commentator will try to address is that this looks nothing like what is described in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 22, which says, in which Moses tells the children of Israel, all of you approached to me and said, let us send men ahead of us. Right, so in Numbers 13, 1, it's, and 2, it's God's idea to send these men to spy the land out. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, 22, it's the people. The people come to Moses, and it's their idea to spy the land out. So Rashi tries to reconcile these two passages. And he... And he uh, he grasps onto this word lacha, right? So it's to send forth for yourself, is in many translations, for yourself. And it's shalach lacha, and it really literally means send to yourself or send for yourself. It's the same grammatical construction we find in God's call to Abraham, which is lech lacha, go for yourself to the land of Canaan, or the land I'll show you. Um, and sometimes you'll find commentators who say this is just a grammatical quirk in Hebrew. It's just, it doesn't necessarily change the meaning of the, of the passage or the sentence. But often, you know, there's no extra letters in the Torah. So um, if it's there, the commentators will also seize on it to give some explanation. And so Rashi uses this word lacha, sent for yourself, to reconcile the, the, ex, the, uh, or the numbers passage here with the Deuteronomy passage. Rashi says, send, uh, shalach lacha means send by your own decision. In other words, I'm not telling you to do this. Do it if you want to. For Israel had come to Moses and said, let us send men ahead of us, as it says in Deuteronomy 1.22. And Moses consulted the divine presence as to how to respond. And then God said, I have already told them that the land is good. Exodus chapter 3, I shall bring you up from the affliction of Egypt to a good land. I swear by their lives that I will now give them room to err through the words of the spies that they wish to send so that they shall not take possession of it. And Rashi gets this from, I think, Midrash Tankuma. It might be in the Gemara as well. Ramban questions this, though. I mean, he's not going to trash the Gemara. He's not going to trash the Midrash, but he has a... He, he's, Remember, Ramban's purpose here is to give the plain interpretation. And Rashi is getting this, he's pulling his Agada out, this story out. That's the extra material here. It's not, it doesn't look like the most simple or plain explanation of the passage. So Rashi's got a few questions. He's going to interrogate uh, this Agada to see, is this, the, is this the plain explanation? It's fine as, it's fine as a Midrash, it's fine as a lesson to be learned. But is it the plain interpretation is the question. So Rashi, Rashi, the way Rashi addresses this, he says, if there's a question to ask here, 
if it's so that the people should not have requested the spies, then Moses made the same mistake. Moses actually sinned here because in Deuteronomy 1 verse 23, after the people say, let's send men to spy at the land, Moses says, that's a great idea. I should do it. Um, he says, I think it, here's the idea was good in my eyes. So Moses agreed with this request. And the idea here, you know, Ramban is sort of, sort of obliquely saying Rashi cannot be correct here, that this is the plain explanation of the passage. Because if Moses did sin, we would have heard about it. Right? He hits a rock one time and all of a sudden he can't go into the promised land. If, he, if it's Moses' sin that caused the people to, to journey in the wilderness for 40 extra years, certainly God would have said something. Certainly we would have heard about it. So to say that Moses sinned here is is just basically to say well this interpretation can't be correct as the plain interpretation of the of this passage all right we're out of time it's not a great place to quit but we get a taste of all the problems involved with this the first part of chapter 13 here R Raman's going to raise at least three why on earth did they feel like they had to send the spies what did the spies actually do wrong and what was moses plan if the spies came back with a bad report i mean if you're sending the spies and they come back and say everything looks great obviously you'll just go in but if they say it looks too hard what are you going to do go back to egypt like what's your plan why are you sending the spies in and uh Rahman's going to answer all those questions but we'll have to get into it next week. There's quite a bit of material and we are out of time. That is fabulous.